Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello, and welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. This week, I have a little bit of a change of plans. I have been studying for some podcasts coming up on forgiveness and intention versus impact and a whole bunch of other really exciting topics. But last week, I learned that my 17-year-old nephew was shot and killed. And this week, we're preparing for a family funeral in Utah. And as much as I tried to sit and to edit those podcasts and to get them ready for publishing, I kept feeling like I wanted to do a podcast on grief because we've been immersed in it for the past five or six days. And Grief isn't just what happens when we lose a person. Grief is when we experience a myriad of different losses. And so I know that most of us listening to this podcast have experienced loss and we've experienced grief. If we've left religion, we've definitely experienced grief. And I kind of just want to delve into what grief is how we experience it, and I just want to normalize it and help us understand what we're experiencing a little bit better today. I haven't been in the practice of sitting with grief quite as intensely as I have this week since leaving High Demand Religion, and I still experience grief from my departure from High Demand Religion, you know, occasionally. There are still times that grief pops up its head from our departure, particularly with the ways it's changed family relationships or things will come up that will remind me of how things used to be and I'll feel grief again. Today I'm going to be talking more about the loss of a person because that's what's on my mind right now. But I want you to sit and be curious with how this applies to the loss of identity the loss of community, the loss of faith, the loss of a relationship with God or Jesus or Allah or Jehovah, the loss of a sense of certainty, the loss of expectations for the future. There's so many losses that can be wrapped in that. The loss of what you thought your family might look like, the loss of relationships. There's, there's so much here. And I want to just open up this box, talk frankly about what the emotions and the physiological responses look like, and what we can do to help keep ourselves as healthy as possible while we process something that is so heavy and devastating. Now, I think before I experienced my departure from high demand religion, I had never really experienced a huge loss. I had, I mean, I had experienced smaller losses before breaking up with a boyfriend, you know, the loss of friendships occasionally as people moved or I moved, but nothing on the scale of leaving high demand religion. And I think I didn't fully understand what grief was until. I left the Mormon church. I thought that grief was just a deep sense of sadness. That's what I thought grief was. Even with my background in psychology, I had heard about the stages of grief. I had heard about anger or anxiety or those different things being a part of grief. 
But I don't think it really registered that grief was more than a deep, intense sadness. But grief is a cocktail of emotions. I know I've used that term before. It's not one specific emotion. It is an amalgam of a whole bunch of different emotions. And it is different. The personal cocktail is different for every single person. I mean, for me personally, this past week, my nephew that passed away, I didn't know very well because of divorce. And so not only am I feeling sadness and empathy for the loss of the 17-year-old life, but I'm also feeling sadness and grief for my brother-in-law that's having to go through this incredible loss and all of his kids and his ex-wife and his girlfriend. I'm going through this, this deep sense of feeling so awful that they're hurting so much. But on top of that, there was a regret that I didn't know this particular nephew better. And on top of that, there was some survivor's guilt that I'm getting to go to the swimming pool with my kids and I'm getting to make s'mores at night with my kids. I still get to snuggle them and read them books at night. We're still getting together with friends. And aside from going to this funeral and participating in sitting with our brother-in-law and listening to his grief and trying to help meet his needs as he prepares for the funeral, my life is largely the same. And there's been some guilt about that that I've had to work through. And it still pops up occasionally. And then on top of that, we left high demand religion and this funeral is happening in a Mormon chapel. And so there's anxiety there. And there's a little bit of fear about seeing a whole bunch of people who will be trying to make sense out of this death from a very religious perspective, which my husband and I know will be triggering on some level. And so there's been listening to the fear and the anxiety and being able to make a plan to keep ourselves safe, a plan to be able to talk with one another, what to do if we feel triggered and we feel anger, how we can support and also take care of our own emotional needs. So it is all the things and it gets to be all the things. There is no right way or wrong way to experience grief. And grief is often our own personal cocktail of emotional experiences. Some of the normal emotions that come up with grief might be regret, guilt, shame, loneliness, numbness, dread, anguish, anxiety, resentment, helplessness, and shock. And it may even include some emotions that we might feel like are inappropriate, like anger or even relief. And it's not unusual to experience several emotions all at once. I think sometimes we think we feel one emotion and then it moves into another emotion But that's not how grief works. It's possible to feel grateful to know a person and deep sadness at the same time. I know over the weekend, as I was checking in with myself regularly, often there were two or three emotions inside of me at any given point. I was feeling anxiety, kind of low-key in the background about the upcoming funeral and feeling deep sadness for my brother-in-law, as well as, like I said, that guilt that we were getting to go to the swimming pool and that we were continuing to live and that life was pretty normal for us. It's been all the things. There's been confusion occasionally. And so, so I just want to normalize that whatever you're feeling is okay. There is no way you should feel There is no way you should process. And it's just allowing whatever is there to be there. The next thing I want to talk about is that grief 
is a normal response for all kinds of loss. We talked about this at the beginning. It's not just about death. We can grieve a hope or a dream that hasn't come to pass. We can grieve an expectation. I know many of us who've left high demand religion maybe had expectations that we would always be close with our family, our families of origin. Maybe we had expectations of what our grown family would look like and what our children would do and what their lives might look like. Grieving those expectations of who we would be, who our families would be, how we would relate and what our relationships would look like is all very normal. We can grieve the end of a chapter in our lives. I still remember being so excited leaving high school and going to college and feeling grief as I left my hometown and as I left the friends I had spent a lifetime with. I remember feeling that sense of loss even as I was beginning a new chapter and feeling excitement about the upcoming college experience. There was a sense of loss that lasted for a while. Every time I would come home, I'd get that kick of missing my hometown, missing what I used to have, missing living at home and being with certain friends that I haven't seen since we graduated and walked across the stage. We might feel grief for feeling displaced, like if we move or if we change careers. There can definitely be grief with that. With religious transition, there's often grief that comes with loss of identity or a loss of the ability to be spiritual or to have a relationship with God, a loss of certainty, a loss of community or friendship, and even just changes in relationships. I know that as we left high demand religion, my husband and I, our relationship had to evolve and we got closer in some ways, but there were other things about the way our relationship used to be that we had to grieve simply because things were different. I've definitely grieved the changes in my relationship with family members like my mother and my brother and even my in-laws. Things are different because I'm different. And so there's been some grief there. The next thing I want to mention is that grief is physical. So last week we talked about somatic experiencing and we talked about how we feel things in our body. And grief is one of those things that we experience very physically as well as emotionally. Grief isn't something that just happens in our head. It's not just an emotional experience. It is something that we physically experience. Our body feels grief at least as actively as our mind does. Symptoms can include like being physically ill or oppressively tired. When you're grieving, sometimes you just want to sleep all day long. You're so tired. Or not being able to sleep, that's also a symptom of grief. It's just not being able to go to sleep. Sometimes you may feel disembodied or outside of yourself or disoriented. And sometimes you may feel so disoriented, it may feel like you're losing your mind. All of this is normal. I just want to normalize that if you're suddenly so tired and you can't seem to get out of bed, you're not broken. You're grieving. And it will get better, but right now you're grieving and you're coping. If you can't sleep at all, that's also normal for grieving. Grief can also change just your daily behavior. I know this week, many of the family members have lost their appetite. And other family members are eating to deal with the emotions. We talked about numbing two weeks ago. And if you're in the middle of grief and you haven't listened to that episode, go listen. It'll help you understand why we reach for certain behaviors to help us feel better. Sleeping 
like we talked about a minute ago, can be a coping mechanism, a numbing behavior, but so can eating a whole lot, right? Eating comfort food. So you may find yourself not able to eat, or you may find yourself just not able to stop eating, and both are normal. You may feel absent-minded or forgetful. And this is a big one that I find when we're leaving high-demand religion, but it also applies to the loss of a person or really any other loss. Sometimes we find that we want to withdraw from people. And I want to talk about this for a minute. Sometimes we just want to be able to sit with our emotions without being interrupted. Other times we're worried about being a burden to people with our pain. And sometimes, and I find this happens especially with the grief that comes from leaving high demand religion, sometimes our grief is because of trauma that was caused and the people in our lives, whether they actually caused us trauma or not, sometimes they are triggers for our trauma and they bring on additional grief. Not because they're bad people, but because they were present when the trauma was happening and we almost cocoon ourselves for a bit in order to be able to process the trauma and hear our own thoughts and not be triggered as much. So if you find that you're wanting to withdraw from people or cocoon yourself a bit, that's normal. And you may feel intensely irritated or angry at anything anyone says to you. When you're on high alert and when you're already feeling so much, sometimes it just feels like you're so irritated and it can be really difficult sometimes to regulate irritation or to assume the best. So if this is happening to you with any kind of loss in your life, know that it's okay. You're just coping and evolving. Give yourself some compassion and grace. You may not be able to be your best, most empathic, most connected self while you're actively grieving. But what's going to happen is the grief won't necessarily get smaller. The grief never really goes away. But what will happen is you'll grow around the grief. It won't be so raw. You'll grow around the grief and you'll be able to integrate it into your life and move with it. You'll be able to bear it better and you will be able to connect with people again at some point in the future. And if you feel like you need to apologize at that point, you can. But right now, be gentle with yourself. What you're experiencing is normal and it doesn't make you an awful person. I also want to talk about the fact that there's no right way to grieve. I think sometimes we have an ideal of what grieving should look like. And often we believe that our way of grieving is the right way to grieve. And especially if we're grieving alongside other people, we might compare our grief to their grief and make judgments that maybe someone isn't feeling enough or is feeling too much. We may believe that some people are minimizing the experience or exaggerating the experience. And some people, the way that they grieve is by tackling and solving problems. They get in there. They want to do something with all of that emotional energy. They want to pour it into a project. They want to start a foundation. They want to, in the case of religious trauma, they want to jump online and create TikTok videos and information. They want to do something. They want to tackle the problem. But others respond in a more emotional way or sometimes a more introspective way, and it may feel quieter. And there are some people that may numb for a while before they are feeling ready to tackle the loss. All of that gets to be okay. People move through grief in a way that feels good to them. Now, something I'm noticing a lot this week, and it's reminding me of when we left high demand religion, and it's 
also reminding me of other losses and other funerals and things that I've gone through. I'm recognizing patterns here is that we're highly uncomfortable with other people being in pain. And so when we're grieving, it will often be hard for other people to see your pain. And sometimes their responses, because of their own discomfort and their own desire to get back to the homeostasis of everything is normal and everything is okay, their responses may hurt or add to your pain. So you may find that some people feel really cold or distant as you go through your loss, even if it's the loss of a child, even if it's the loss of your religion, the loss of a pregnancy, the loss of a job, the loss of a house. Some people may feel cold or distant because they don't know how to respond. They're not sure what to do, so they choose to withdraw instead. And some people are so scared by your loss, like it rocks them to their core. This is especially true of leaving high demand religion, losing your faith. That prospect is so scary for some people that they withdraw completely. They aren't just cold or distant. They leave your life either temporarily or permanently. Almost as if the loss is contagious because it brings up so much fear for them. And some may tell you to stop feeling sorry for yourself. Especially if you're still talking about the loss six months later, a year later, two years later, five years later. If you're like me, what we're going on what, four years now? and you're still podcasting about things like grief, there may be people who are ready for you to just stop talking about it already. And they feel like going through your feelings and allowing yourself to feel and allowing yourself to process is you being a victim. But allowing yourself to feel and to process is necessary for healing. Stuffing emotions. If you've been listening to me since January, you know that I believe stuffing emotions leads not just to increased mental and emotional distress, but also physical illness. Talk about your feelings as much as you need to in order to be able to process them. You're not being dramatic, you're grieving. And that's okay. I want you to know that when other people respond this way, their reactions are not about you. It's not that you're taking up too much space. It's not that you're grieving too much or being too dramatic or any of those things. When people have these reactions, it's about their own emotions and their own fear surrounding your loss. They might not be ready to cope with the emotions that attend your loss. My nephew passed away this past week. Like I said, I didn't know him very well. I even had times where I was like, I shouldn't be experiencing any emotions about this. Even as a a therapist, I know that cognitively that's not right. And yet I still had that voice in my head that said, you didn't know him well enough to have any feelings about this. And yet I did. I had to be emotionally present with myself and process through my feelings to be able to hold my brother-in-law's feelings and his family's feelings in order to be able to open space for them to feel what they feel without trying to fix it and to just allow them to experience grief. I had to be able to be aware of my own emotions and process my own emotions and hold myself so that I could also hold them. But many people are not that emotionally aware. 
And so grief is incredibly difficult for people who are not used to holding their own emotions and locating their own feelings and working through their own feelings. It'll be very difficult for them to hold you in your feelings. So it's really important that as you're grieving, you find people who are emotionally aware, who have done the work to get comfortable feeling who have done the work to get comfortable holding space for difficult emotions. If you're not used to feeling these difficult emotions, it will be so hard to sit in those emotions with someone else. A lot of times I see people get antsy. They want to do something. They want to fix it. But grieving is not about fixing. Grieving is about allowing. And that's really hard sometimes for people to do when they're uncomfortable feeling. So just know if you have family members that are uncomfortable feeling, it's not about you, it's about them, and find some people that can sit with you in the discomfort without trying to fix you or silver lining what you're experiencing, that can just sit and empathize and allow and validate and love you no matter how complicated the process is. The next thing I want to talk about with grief is that it bounces around and it comes in waves. Grief is not a linear process. As much as we would like it to be, as I've read about the stages of grief, they look so linear. It's this like V-shaped or U-shaped graph and it talks about how we're in denial first and then next this is what happens and you know next we bargain and then next there's anger and It kind of looks like we go through these stages, but that's not actually how grief works. And honestly, in the past couple of years, we're learning that there are more than five stages of grief. There's things like anxiety that pop up. And we're also learning that grief is more this like complicated ball of yarn, if you will, where Yes, we experience denial and shock and numbness and we definitely bargain and we definitely feel anger and there is a a stage of acceptance and there's also anxiety and there's just, there's all of these different components, but we don't feel them in a linear manner. Often we feel, we either bounce back and forth between several of them, like I might be feeling numb and shock and then I'm feeling angry and then I'm bargaining and then I'm feeling angry again and then I'm back to being numb and then I accept it for a bit but then I go back to feeling angry and this is normal but sometimes we feel like we're doing it wrong whenever we're bouncing back and forth like I thought I healed this I thought I wasn't in the numb stage anymore why am I back over here feeling numb and feeling shock and then now I'm angry I thought I worked through the anger if you're grieving It is completely normal to bounce around between all of the different emotions and sometimes to be in several of the stages at one time. It is completely possible to be bargaining and angry all at the same time. So whatever you're experiencing, know that it's okay. Now we also talked about how grief comes in waves. What I mean by that is the first waves of grief can feel like a tsunami. What's coming to mind for me, and I'm tearing up a little because the most significant loss I've ever experienced in my life has been the loss of my religion and my identity and my community, my relationship with God, my loss of certainty. Like it was all of those losses all at one time. And I remember... We hadn't left yet, but the grief process had already started. The ground underneath our feet felt so shaky. My husband was washing dishes, and I was in the living room, and we were talking about temple ordinances, which are super important in the Mormon faith. It's what binds you together as a family. And as you know, one of the most important things in our life is our family for most of us. And we were talking about our kids and what the possibility of leaving might do to our family. 
And I remember my husband sort of mentioning, if we leave, that means our temple ordinances are null and void. We aren't sealed together as a family. There's no afterlife. We've sorted through that since then and have come to find value and meaning in being together in this life and really just milking the joy and the being present with one another here in this life since we don't know what happens next. But I remember that first wave of, oh my gosh, this is happening, crashing over me. And I crumpled to the carpet and sobbed for an hour. And I couldn't come up for air. It felt so heavy. It was so crushing. And I just laid there in the fetal position, crying and crying and crying. And I remember feeling at times that first year or two, wondering if I would ever be happy again, like truly happy. I had bright flashes of hope and excitement. Don't get me wrong. There were definitely things that were better Sundays, getting to hike with my kids or go to the pool or go have ice cream or just getting to sleep in were amazing. Getting to keep the 10% of tithing instead of giving it to the church and getting to send it to people who actually needed it for clean water or to help people who were abused by their spouses or to help the LGBTQ movement. I mean, it felt amazing to donate our money someplace where we could actually see it make a difference. There were things that got markedly better almost immediately. And yet, and yet, the grief was so heavy and so crushing that first year, especially. I wondered if I would ever feel really, truly happy and joyful ever again. I learned, however, that the way grief works is as those first waves feel like a tsunami and they're so heavy and you feel washed out. But eventually you learn. I don't know if the waves become smaller. I don't think that's what happens. But you get better at navigating the waves and they become less devastating because you know what to expect and you know you're not going to be washed out to sea. You might be triggered by something, you know, music at Christmas time or a birthday or a holiday or something that reminds you of what you lost and you'll have that wash of grief and sadness. But you learn to trust that you can tolerate it, it doesn't feel as scary and you're able to ride it out and process it and it recedes. So just know if you're bouncing all over the place with grief, if you're feeling tons of things at once and if the grief comes and you feel like you might never be happy again, that's normal. And then if it recedes and you're like, actually life is good, but then another wave comes also so normal. I want to talk about too, that grief often gets harder before it gets better. The hardest time is usually four to six months after your loss. Because those first four to six months, there's a lot of shock and there's a lot of numbness. And it's about four to six months in when it sets in that this is your new reality And you really have to start coping with the loss of things that used to feel so normal. And what's crazy about that is our society really only allows a couple of days to a couple of weeks for grieving after loss. Really, they don't allow any time (laughs) for grieving a faith or religion loss. But if you've lost a person, 
people will allow a couple of days to a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months after the loss. But right about the time your loss actually really hits you, the full depth and breadth of what you've lost really starts to hit home. Your family members and friends have moved on and they will expect that you've done the same. And so this can become a really lonely part of grieving. And there's a couple of things that I recommend during this time. One of them is having a trusted friend. We talked earlier about someone who can listen to your complicated feelings without trying to fix them. If you don't have a friend that can do this for you, please seek a grief therapist or guidance mentor or coach who is well-versed in what grief looks like, who can help you normalize the process and feel like you're not alone. It can be so important during this time. They'll also help you educate your friends and family on what you're experiencing and normalize that for them so that they can then show up and be a better support for you if that's what they desire to do. Highly recommend having someone who can sit with you during these feelings, especially at that four to six month mark when you're still going to need months, if not years of someone to listen to you as you process and as that wound becomes less tender. I also highly recommend a grieving community. Now, in ex Mormon dumb. A lot of us have created ex-Mormon communities because we get to talk about our feelings with people who are also grieving, processing, going through it. There is something so healing about being able to speak your feelings and your experience to other people who just get it. And you don't feel like you're taking up too much space or that your feelings are too big or that they're too much or that they're lasting too long. So I highly recommend if you've lost a child, joining a group for people grieving child loss. If you've lost your faith, joining a group of people who are also going through that. You can find these online. There's lots of different communities there. I have a community called Emancipate Yourself where we're talking about these issues on a regular basis online. People are really starting to share there, and it's becoming a beautiful community. I would love to have you join. That link will be in the show notes if that's something you need, if you need that community. And then also, if you need someone to listen, please feel free to message me if you don't have anyone else. Share with me your story and allow me to listen and to witness you and to validate your experience. And of course, if you're needing someone to help walk you through the grief process of leaving high demand religion, I would be honored to be that person for you as well as a religious transition and trauma recovery coach. There's one last thing I want to talk about before we kind of wrap things up here. And that is that it is okay to take care of yourself. Survivor's guilt is real, you guys. Often what happens when we experience a loss Sometimes it seems we feel like if we take care of ourselves, it's like the loss wasn't that important, that we almost need to stop living in order to honor the loss. And actually, when we take care of ourselves, it's one of the best things we can do to stay emotionally healthy while we carry these heavy, difficult things and while we process through all of these difficult emotions. Grief presents us with a paradox, particularly when we lose a person. It is absolutely possible to honor the memory and to remember and to grieve while also allowing ourselves to live and to grow and to expand and to move forward. It doesn't have to be one or the other. One of the things we talk about on this podcast is moving out of binary thinking. There's so much freedom in allowing it to be both. You can feel deep 
deep grief and have a beautiful life. You can experience happiness and a sense of sadness that someone's not there with you at the same time. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I find that when we've lost a person, sometimes we will squash things that make us happy or that make us feel whole, that make us laugh, that make us feel alive because we feel like we're doing a disservice to the person that we lost or that we're somehow forgetting them in doing that. But we can carry that sense of loss with us of, I miss you and I wish you were here as we also live our lives and take care of ourselves. It gets to be both. So I find that real life doesn't often happen in binary situations. It's usually not either or. It's often a complicated mix of many things that exist all at the same time. And that gets to be okay. I think that's all I want to say today. Thank you so much for sitting with me as I've normalized grief, what that experience is like, felt into the different emotions we might all experience as we process loss. I hope you were able to take some nuggets of wisdom from it and apply them to your life and help you understand yourself or someone you know that's grieving a little bit better. I'm not sure what next week's episode is going to be about. I'm allowing myself to go to this funeral and see what bubbles to the surface. So next week will be a surprise to you and me both. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts, your experiences, your wisdom, the things you've learned over on the Facebook group. Also, if you would like some tools to help you through grief I've been sharing things in the newsletter. Please go and visit my website, emancipatedcoaching.com and sign up for the newsletter. What I would do if I were you is either look at the banner at the top of the page or wait for the pop-up and put your information there and it'll give you free access to a program that I put together about perfectionism. And I would love for you to have that. It's a fantastic program on perfectionism and allowing ourselves to make mistakes and to show up and allow ourselves to be messy humans that are curious and learning and growing. But be looking for newsletters that have to do with grief. And some of the topics that are coming up, I'm constantly giving free tools, journal prompts, and ideas to help you move through religious transition, religious trauma, loss, grief, but also giving you tools to find hope and joy and find yourself even more. So I look forward to seeing you all both in the newsletter and in the Facebook group. And I look forward to interacting with you and hearing about your own experiences and getting to know you better. If this has been helpful for you, please take a screenshot and share it on your social media and don't forget to tag me. There are so many people that need tools to help them through religious transition and trauma and I want to be able to get those tools into their hands. So if you feel comfortable, if you feel safe, please take a screenshot, share it with something that you learned or something that was helpful for you from this podcast or one of the podcasts that you like the best and invite people to come and listen and to get the support and tools that will help them move forward and get the lives that they deserve. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you next week, and I can't wait to see what we will talk about.